again, and uh, we want to look at what we ought to focus on as we look at the content of what we're going to share with people. I think this is important. Much of the content that people share uh, in, when they talk about fish as a man, to me, they are very, very inadequate. Uh, so you tell people, would you like to go to heaven? That's it. Uh, would you like to have your problem solved? And I think we really missed the point. So after a while, Christianity becomes a faith that is unreal, that is almost irrelevant. That's uh, this is my biggest, biggest concern. On the other hand, um, we have the gospel being shared with people as, uh, do you want to be wealthy? Do you want to be healthy? Focus is life on this earth. And I think we missed the point both ways. So what do we share seriously when we talk about our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? What do we share with people when we talk about uh, we become a fisher of men? Well, this is what I normally share. I, this is something that we uh, want to work with. See, there will always be problems in life. And, and my approach towards life is really always to look at Christ in every sense of the word. Because of what we know about him, because of what we believe about him, because of our understanding of how he lived his life, and so we learn to cope with life. Okay, so I have a very, very Christ-centered approach, which will also mean that if you don't have a strong relationship with the Lord, you can't do this effectively. Right? You really, really can't do this effectively unless you understand what it means. So I, I, like, I like to look at the Lord Jesus Christ and I see his example. I see his example in life. I see the tremendous sense of purpose in his life. And I always ask people, what's your purpose in life? And a lot of people have no focus. Besides, I, I want to do what I, what I want to do. Seriously, the lack of focus is horrifying today. Beyond having a good time. Are you enjoying yourself? What, what purpose? What on earth is your purpose on this earth? I mean, at 10 years, we, 10 years old, we don't expect a child to understand purpose in life. But 20 years later, what's your purpose? You still can't figure it out? 30 years old, we still haven't figured it out, what life is all about? 40 years old, 50 years old, 60 years old, 70 years old, what on earth is our life's purpose? And a lot of people haven't figured out what it's all about. Unfortunately. And so a lot of people look at life and they say, well, uh, eat, drink, be merry. Tomorrow we die. That's it. So what do we do? We spend a lot of time eating, drinking, and uh, living it up. And tomorrow we die. You know, you wish you can die. The problem is you don't. You know, it's a sad, some, something of a sad reality. We're talking about kids over in UK. And this boy started at 13 years old to, to take part. He went on to develop a, having to sustain of a habit that makes him depend upon drugs at $250 a day. How are you going to sustain that? A month. 
what do you do? You steal. What do you do? You do whatever you can to bring that money in, to sustain that drug habit. What's your purpose? And I've seen people lose a sense of purpose. I had this young man from Singapore, he went to New Zealand, he did a course and finished his business administration degree, came back home, worked for a few years, and he became a manager in two years. He was outstanding. Then he went to the drugs and he lost everything. He lost everything, all his dreams, hopes, and all that, absolutely gone. Do you know the drugs actually stay inside your body for many years after? They don't go away. You take marijuana, and it's going to stay in your blood system for the next seven years. Your brains are affected. Why do that? What's your purpose? You know, when we were younger as, as children, we grew up with, you got to make it in life so that you can support your family. Today, kids don't, don't grow up that way. When I grow up, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my own thing. Perhaps even more so in Australia. What's your purpose? Doing your own thing is your purpose? That's it. What's purpose? So I look at the life of the Lord Jesus Christ and he says, I have come to do the will of him who sent me. His purpose was, I have been sent. That's what we talked about last night. What were you sent to do? Do you have a sense of purpose? I mean, this is important. What's our sense of purpose? I think this is something that we need to look at very, very carefully. In this case here, example of serving the Lord. But you, when you have a sense of purpose, you also need a sense of power. And they, they need, you need to have both. You cannot have purpose without power. Having purpose without pur pu power is going to be frustration. You can't finish it. You can't fulfill it. That's all there is to it. What well, we need to look at it very, very, very carefully. What can we do about it? If I don't have power, I want to find that power, whatever I need. Otherwise, my life is just going to drift. Can I do something about my life? Can I get my act together? I will need the power from the Lord or I am dead. There's so many people who are not only purposeless, they are powerless. They're caught up in a, in a world that they cannot handle. It's going to be like this. It's never going, to go, never going to be anything better than that. Never. It's going to be here, next year, the same. Am I going to be promoted further? Am I going to get a better life? Am I going to... No. Because people without a sense of purpose just never get anywhere. One person wrote to me and just, just yesterday and said, Pastor, what do you think? I have been sent uh, by my company and I am, they are pushing me to a higher level. But I need to do an overseas stint. What do you think? Should I go? And I said, it's not, it's not, it's not just training. It's helping you to mature further. Go ahead, do it. That is so important. And these people are going to it. Another person who wrote is Ed George, who said, Pastor, I, you know, I'm doing well in my company and I am looking at being sent again. How do these people, and they decided a few people, how can they be so successful in their careers and also in church? How can they do both? And I decided two people and they are outstanding. Because both of them are very, very high flyers, very successful in their careers, but in church, they are also as committed. Why not? Why can't we have both? We have Daniel who is successful in his career and successful as a prophet of God too. Is it not possible? Oh yes, it is. There is a person who... Uh, 
very, very deeply committed. And this man was a person who owns a chain of stores in the U.S. And he's, um, it's called Hobby Lobby. And he's right, he is one of those billionaires in the U.S. And, and all the franchises that he gives out to people, he makes this clause. You don't open on a Sunday. And they calculated how much he would lose in a year if he doesn't open on a Sunday. 150 million U.S. a year. And he said, we are not going to open on a Sunday. This is our time for worship and our time for service and our time for family. 150 million is nothing. It cannot be compared to faithfulness to God, serving God fruitfully. Is he poorer? But when you are a billionaire, you tell him. And we are not billionaires. Let's not talk about it. That is his focus. He says, what do we lose? We lose everything if God is not in the center of our life. That's how to be successful in career, becoming a billionaire, and still be successful in serving the Lord humbly. Is it possible? Yes. There is another chain, a uh, uh, fried chicken chain, and, and besides KFC in the US. There are many, many chains like that. And this one is called Chickafield. And the, this group, it's the same, has the same commitment. We will not open on Sundays, no matter how much we can make on that one Sunday. C.K. Tang, the old owner, before he passed on, had the same thing. He will not open on a Sunday. And then he said, this is how much I lose if I don't open on a Sunday. Two million dollars a day. That's what he gains in one day as a retail store at CK Tang. And he says, I am not going to open. It's a day for worship. It is a day for service. It's a day of doing what we could or we can for the Lord. Unfortunately, the legacy doesn't stay with the sons. That's what it is. To all who are pastors, he gave us all passes. You have a flat 20% discount from CK Tang. Use your pass. This is yours. This is his commitment. Can we be successful, both secular and spiritual? The example of the Lord Jesus is very real. A sense of purpose, a sense of power. We need both. So when I speak of helping people to come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't speak of soul winning. I speak of a whole life. What's your life like? A lot of people are interested in the soul being saved, but not in a life being lived. I think we miss the point. We really miss the point if that's, what we, that's our focus. Why do we speak of the Lord Jesus Christ? So many things. Well, one part of it is salvation, and it is such a lot. A lot of people don't even know that they are caught in sin. They can't get out. Why can't they get out? It's very, very obvious. It is a sin problem, and we need to be saved from our sins. You take a look at, at the lifestyle over here. After a while, everybody takes it for granted. Yeah, it's normal. This is called normal. This is the new normal. New normal. Drink. Get drunk. Normal. Until your hospitals are crying out about the schoolies. Every weekend, the hospitals are bursting because of people who are drunk. And this is called normal. So when people go around and they sleep around the place, it's normal. 
All these things are considered normal today. It's all part of your growing up. If that's my daughter, it's not going to happen. This is what it is. Is that my daughter? It's not going to happen. What is this all about? And we don't realize that we are trapped and then we go into drugs. It's normal. It's a young people's thing, you know. It's everybody goes through it. Not everybody. Not if you have a sense of purpose. Not if you have a sense of power. You don't have to. You don't have to. You don't want to. It's so important that we understand this. To us, it's not a question of what the world calls normal. It's a question of what is right, if what is good, what is purposeful, what is powerful. This is how we live. It's what we want to do. What do you want? It's your testimony. How do you live your life? And if your life, your testimony is not worth talking about, how do people listen to you seriously? How? How do you get serious with that? This is your life. This is your example. This is your testimony. You can keep it. Not impressed. This is the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. But a lot of people are trapped in that. And we need to reach out because every year it gets worse every time. Now we're talking about schoolies over here and it gets worse. And we think it's all right and people, get, people die. And is that normal too? People have AIDS. Is that normal too? Where's our normalcy? We've lost it. What then? What, what next? Everybody is doing this. But we are not your normal person. We are called. We are saved. We are children of God. We are holy. We are different. That is the point of it all, isn't it? We wear our title Christian with great joy, with great pride, with great honor, with great distinction. That's what we are. Otherwise, we're just like the rest of the world. And we want to be servants of God. You've got to be kidding. you really got to be kidding. It's not going to work. And so we speak of Christ who can give to us our life and its meaning. What is it all about? Okay, so where does it begin? The Lord Jesus Christ tells the disciples, you are my witnesses. So we witness to people. You see, this is what it means to be a Christian. And I'm a Christian, this is how I live. Why do I want to go to church? Because I want to. This is me. This is my life. And the sense of purpose and the sense of power is outstanding, is exhilarating. This is what it means to be a fisher of men. We witness. Our life is a witness. The very sense of purpose and power in our life is witness to the reality of our faith in the Lord. And it's something that we don't want to miss out on. And it all has to do with Christ Jesus. And it really, really has to do with the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is important for us. Okay? What, what are we? Matthew tells us we are salt. Either we are salt or we are sand. They look alike. And salt is essentially what it is. You know it is salt. You taste it, you know it is salt. 
And if you cannot taste the salt, then it is just simply sand. It is useless. You don't put sand in, onto your food. It's grisly. You can't partake of it. And so Jesus Christ was right when he says, you are simply salt of the earth. By sheer nature of the being, this person is a Christian, he is automatically salt. In the early days, salt was part of the pay of a, of a Roman soldier. You get paid with salt. That's why we say, you're not worth your salt. In other words, you're not worth your pay. That's what it is, salt. Salt was used to preserve food. Salt was used to treat wounds. Salt was used in a number of other ways. Salt was part of the offering given to the Lord as a necessity, to stress necessity. Are you salt? Or are you like the rest of the world? Salt and sand, you cannot distinguish them from afar. Even when you're nearby, it looks exactly the same. But when you taste it, you know, this is salt or this is sand. Are you distinguishable as a Christian? That's what we were meant to be, distinguishable. Distinct. Then we go on further. Jesus said, you are light. Can I live my life by your light? Can I? What's your light? What does the light should say? How does your light shine? So this is what it means to be a Christian. I take a look at your life and I know this is what it means to be a Christian. This is what it means to be a child of God. This is what it means to be a fisher of man. This is what it means to be a servant of God. Distinctively, like a light. That's what Jesus said. I'm the light of the world. He showed the disciples how to live. He showed the people what it means to belong to God. By very nature of light. That's what we are, light. But for many believers, it's not light, it's darkness. The light has gone out a long time ago. They are no difference. You look at the difference. What is the difference? Everything we have to do, it would be distinct, it would be different. But someone can say to you, you know, you're very different. Oh, yes, I am. Thank you very much. Well, why are you like that? Because I am different. I am salt and I am light. And that is a reality. So it doesn't matter whether I'm in India or whether I'm in Myanmar or whether I'm in Perth or whether I'm in Singapore. It's exactly the same. No difference. I don't need people to see me to be me. I am just simply me. I am not here to perform. I'm not here for people to see me visibly. So when I read the scriptures here with you, it's the same thing I do on my own without anybody noticing it. It's exactly the same. Light is light. Salt is salt. Collectively, we become a city. A city that is distinct. So when I went to Naypyidaw, the capital of, of, of uh, Myanmar, I was surprised by that city. It was the most, literally, one of the most developed cities that I've seen in Asia. I mean, as in developed it has got a spanking hospital with a full staff and there's no patients. Except the soldiers, the colonels, the majors, the generals who need treatment. No queue. They have got a good library, nice facilities, just nobody's there. They've got good roads, seven, uh, seven lanes going one way, seven lanes going, 14 lanes. No cars. Spanking new airport with the only flights going in, going out. One flight, three flights a day. One going in, one going out, same people, and then one extra from another airline. Three a day, that's it. And one plane can sit 80-something people, less than 100 people. That's it. 
So less than 300 people, a whole airport with all the facilities, and that's it. So we went to the most expensive restaurant, whatever that means. And it was very ordinary food. Nobody was there. So I asked, how do you all survive? It's a city. And a city will be known by what it is. Automatically. And after a while, everybody knows. So this is the city. It's all prepared. They say there's infrastructure. The hotels are there. The amusement parks are there. The things are there. You name it. Just no people. Why are not people going there? Because there's nothing to do there. There's really nothing to do there. Why would people want to bother to go there? You go in there to fill forms. That's it. Nothing more than that. And it's important for us to grow, to understand all these challenges. What are we as a church collectively? And this is important because we are all part of the whole city. We all make up the city. We are the roads. We are the limes. It is the most beautifully lit city. In Yangon, you have power failure. You get three days or four days of electricity. The rest of the week don't have. That's normal. But there is 24-7, seven, seven days in a week. Seven, seven. No problem. Electricity will always be there. But of course, it benefits only the generals and the colonels and the majors. That's all there is to it. What about the Christian city? What? We are a city on a hill. People look at you and say, wow, that's a city. So what do they see? What do they see? That's how we are. That's what we're meant to be. Can you see this? Now go on further. Okay? We were known by the good works we do. Matthew 5 and 16. We concentrate on what it means to be a vibrant church. Take a look at what Paul describes for Timothy, what the church is meant to be. Jesus said he will build the church. Well, let's take a look at 1 Timothy, and, and we'll see the description of a church that is truly thriving. And so he tells Timothy, this is what you should look, look at what you should look at very, very carefully. This is what the church was meant to be. This is something that we want to consider. Right? And it is something, uh, the church, a house of God, that you may know how you ought to behave in the house of God. In verse 15, rather than verse 16. Okay? And so, um, this is what it is. What is this church meant to be? Okay, It is the house of God. What's your house like? I think all of us would like to try and take pride in the house that we have. Whatever the house may be. And I've seen people living in HDB apartments in, in Singapore. About 80% of the people live in those apartments. And some of those apartments are beautifully finished. And I've seen them. They have got very good carpeting. They've got luscious things. I've seen them and they are really, really, really beautiful things. That's their house. Their house is the statement. The church is meant to be house of God. What statement are we making about the house of God? And this is important for us to consider. So we bear witness for the Lord collectively. Now we go on further to see what this is. Okay, house of the living God. The pillar. Wow. It's meant to be strong. Bulwark. And if the church is not focused on being strong doctrinally, in truth, what is the church? It's become a community center. 
The church was never meant to be like that. It meant to be a pillar, a bulwark of truth. So I'm committed to telling you the truth, even if the truth hurts. That's what it is. So this is the bulwark of truth there. Okay? And this is an important, how do we see this? Verse 15. Right? And this is something that we want to really, really think about what the church can be, what the church was meant to be. And so we look at the whole idea, the whole gamut. Let's take a look at the whole thing, what we're meant to be. Fishes of men. When Bethany first began, we had 25 people. That's all we started with. The hall was maybe less than this size. That's all we have. Certainly not this size. Maybe a third of this, this hall here. That was it. That's how we began, 25 people. Then when people began to come, I had to ask myself, how do I see people coming? This was my commitment. This is going to be the house of God. This is going to be the pillar and bulwark of truth. And anyone who comes to Bethany will know that here we love the truth, we will proclaim the truth, we are committed to truth, and we are not going to water down the truth. It doesn't matter if people don't like the message, they don't like the messenger, they think that I preach too hard messages. I'm not here to please people. I'm here to be what the church was meant to be. The bulwark of truth. If the church does not stand on the truth of the word of God, what is it for? What is it doing? It's not doing anything. And so now it's a different story. We have people reaching out to people at every level. We have people reaching out to children. We have people reaching out to older people. We have people reaching out to the sick. We have rich people reaching out to the people who speak only dialects. We have people who reach out to people at higher levels in terms of, of, of uh, society. Uh, these are people who are significant people. Then a whole church becomes alive. But we're all committed to preaching and speaking about the truth that is in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we want to be. So then we become fishers of men individually. We become fishers of men collectively. So when people come to church, you know, and we, we hope that people will say, listen, we want you to come because this is where the truth is going to be proclaimed. This is where Christ is going to be exalted. This is the gospel that we believe in with all our heart. This is our life. This is our lifestyle. Then individually and collectively, we will make a very effective witness. But if not, the church will always be weak and it cannot win people to Christ at all. And so the church will dwindle and it will die. Or if it still continues to have people, it will be a place that is barren of truth and it is going to be affected sooner or later. So this is our commitment. This is what we want the church to be. This is what our lives were meant to be. This is how we want to live. And you see, the disciples of, of the Lord Jesus Christ, each one bearing witness. Whether it is Peter reaching out to the Jews, there is the man for the hour. Or whether it is Paul reaching out to the Gentiles, there is another man for that hour. Or whether it is Philip, the individual, all right, here you go, reach out to people individually. That a church was alive, made up of people who were alive, sensitive to the Lord, obedient to His calling, and absolutely committed to being witnesses for Christ, being fishers of men. And I think this is how the church will grow. And this is the challenge for Bethel. 
You see, the challenge is how do you see yourself growing? Well, let me give you an idea of what we should look at and some of the things that we need to look at very, very carefully. This is for Bethel. Okay, and everyone will, every church will have his own thing over very, very, very carefully. Okay, we'll begin with our members. And we need to really, really equip ourselves. We need to be equipped, we need to be empowered, and we need this whole idea of a vision. What is it that we need to grow? This is first and foremost. The church must come alive first. It must become that city. It must become that house of God first. We'll do anything and everything to make sure this is where we are. Because if we are not on the same platform, there is nothing to look forward to. Right? You can't win. You cannot have one person trying to talk to everybody. Hello, 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 hello. You die. You just can't. So you need people who will be good with young people, others with children, others with adults, and so on and so forth. We are all needed. You cannot have one person doing it all. That's impossible. Do you know why I seldom do pastoral work over here? Because Chris has to do it. Because if I start doing pastoral work here, I will do him a big disservice. He has to do this because he is the resident pastor. Right? It's very, very important. So I'm very conscious that I must, certain things I will not do, I must not do, because this is what he must do in order to build his ministry. And this is important. So when Auntie Sally comes over here, uh, unless she's invited to play the organ or the piano, she will not touch it because the local people must do it. She may have been organizing a, a big kitchen, a kitchen crew in church, but not here. The people here must do it, not the people from outside. This is our understanding. This is our practice. We will be here to support where we can. But the bulk of the work must be done by the local church, not overseas people. This is so important, a principle we must lay down. But we must constantly equip young people. But young people must have a vision for beyond young people. In a few years' time, you become an adult. In a few years' time, you become people who are going out to the world to work. What will you become? And young people become young adults. Young adults have their families. This is where we tend to lose them. Once they start working, they're gone. They're caught up with the world. They're caught up with themselves. They're caught up with whatever the family challenges are. That's it. We've lost them. And if we keep losing them, then Bethel will always be struggling. We need the young people to stand up and say, we are going to become the pillars of the church. We are going to form the bulwark. We're going to be the walls of the church. This is going to be our strength for the church. You've got to catch a vision of it all. Or we miss the point. Or we need this. Otherwise, the church will always be weak. Yes, you have people coming to church. They will be there on a Sunday. But the strength of the church is not in how many people come on a Sunday. It's in the program and activities of what the church can do. And there must be things. For Bethany, it's different. I have put into place a succession plan. And I tell them very clearly what they must do, what they must look forward to. They must replace me. They must replace my work. 
And it is a very hard piece of work to do, to replace my work. Make no bones about it. You either train hard and succeed, or the work will go down the drain in the next generation. Will two young men be sufficient? Frankly, answer is no. Because I do the work of several people, not one person. Can it be done? Yes. But we've got to catch the vision. And so this is what I envision for Bethany, what I'm hoping that we'll see at Bethel too. But if the church doesn't come alive to winning people for the Lord by your life, by your words, by your works, you're never going to grow a strong church. And you are capable. Why do you think we built the church this size? Well, when we first had a car park, everybody thought it was crazy. Why have such a big car park? Now you tell me it's crazy. Now you may have to go underground because it's not enough. And that is a reality. That is not, no, no longer enough. You can't put in another 50 cars, can you? And so we have to plan all these things for the future. And in time to come, 10 years, 20 years from today, there must be other people who will say, I want to serve the Lord in a pastoral ministry. Christopher can take this when he's still young. With every year, it gets more and more challenging. And it gets more and more difficult. Not because of it. It's just sheer time. You just don't have the time. You just don't have the energy. You've got to see this is what the Lord meant the church to be. You see, it's meant to be alive. It's meant to be thriving. It's meant to be, you know, it's really, really meant to be alive to all the things that are in the world. We are different. Will there be resistance? Will there be opposition? You bet. The opposition will come. And I, I must tell you, the opposition will come in every sense of the word. The world will challenge you. They will tell you. And you have, when I talk about the world, I'm not talking about the world outside. I'm talking about the world inside. You are going to have young people who will bring in the ideas of the world into the church. Sure. You know, this is something that's important. Sometimes we have people who, uh, they, want to, they want to sing in the choir, and, and, and I'm glad. Uh, Auntie Sally was telling me there were a few people who were dressed, and she said, nope. Until you dress appropriately, you're not going to sing in a choir. Stop. Would you dare to make those standards here? And a lot of people, ah, we must now, it's okay. What if it's not okay? Somewhere, somewhere, somehow, sometime, we've got to draw the line. There will be opposition. Why, well, you're very strict. Yes, we are. Why? Because we are the church. We are not a world. That's your difference. Why can't we be like, our, our, like who we are? Why do we need to be like that of the world? Yes. You think the evil one will just sit there and let you grow? It will, he will not. He will attack the church. He will attack the church through doctrine. He will attack the church through enemies. He will attack the church through his own people. He will stumble the leaders. He will stumble the people. Any way, every way he can do it, he will. His sole purpose, if not to kill the church, to paralyze it. And that's how it works. And so we, it, it, the church is hurt along the way badly. And so in Singapore, when we have newspapers, everyone who is there, and they, you know, sometimes I go down to, I, I, I needed to change my car a couple of years ago. It was getting old, so I was going to change the car. 
and the person who's selling the car, and they say, oh, you're a pastor. Are you one of them? Oh, boy. Straight away, they associate me with uh, the people. I say, excuse me, there are hundreds of churches. There's only one. We're not like, we're not like that. Oh. That's how it is. That's how you can end up with a bad name for the Lord Jesus Christ. We have to keep our light shining. We have to be salt. We have to be a city on the hill. It cannot be hidden. Who we are, what we are, what we attempt to do will become very, very, very clear. If we want to become effective servants of God, fishers of man, we've got to get our act together. And it's important. And it begins with, it begins everywhere. You know, are there words which are not necessary to say? Don't say them. Do we need to pass comments? We don't. Why, why say it? And along the way, we stumble people. Why? Why should we want to do it? It's just so wrong. It could be anything. Why can't people see us for what we are? As people who love the Lord, who love to speak of Christ, who care for people genuinely. Why can't we do that? I think it's impossible. It's important. I like the story of an old abbot. And his monastery was, you know, they live in enclaves. And he was dying, but he knew that there was a lot of rivalry among his monks. He knew that they were fighting each other. Everybody is wanting to be the, 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 the next abbot. And, they would, and the, the friction was really bad. People were speaking with each other. And the whole community outside, they were not impressed. In his dying moments, he said to the community, to his monks, he said, the Lord has given me a word. Some of you are going to be prophets and apostles. Now, I'm not saying his theology is right. I'm just saying that that's what he said. Because he was such a respected, wise abbot, they listened to him. You mean God will raise us up to be a prophet or to be an apostle? Straight away, their behavior changed. Because the person you speak to could be, the, could be the next apostle, could be the next prophet, could be the next abbot. Oh, oh please, have a seat. Well, can I help you? Suddenly, the language changed, their attitudes changed, their actions changed, everything changed because the next that person is going to be somebody else. Higher and approved by the Lord, blessed by the Lord. You speak to the person a little bit more carefully. And I think that's, how, that's what it is. That's what, and suddenly everything changed. They became more loving, they became more considerate, they became kinder, they became a little bit more, uh, you know, I mean, they were just more civil, they spoke better, they were, they were more prayerful, they grew in their faith, they began to exhibit the fruit of the Lord Jesus Christ in their life. That community grew significantly. And that's what it is. But you know, the real, that's, a, that's a story. But the real story is a man called Bernard of Clairvaux. Jesus, the very thought of the writer. Bernard of Clairvaux was a Frenchman, very wealthy family. The first thing he did in following Christ was to give up his wealth. He began to live a very godly, saintly life. And the people who saw his life were so attracted by his lifestyle. Doesn't swear, doesn't curse, doesn't drink. Really, he wanted to live a life that was pure. And the men who were out there, they began to look at their own lives 
And they said, our life stinks. Our life is bad. And they asked Bernard or Clairvaux, can we follow you? Can we follow? Now, this is France. Known for drinking. Known for women. We're known for life at any, in any century. And so he said, yes, but this is how we must live our life. Devoted to Christ, serving the Lord, helping the community. Our Christian witness is alive. And they began to turn swamp lands into fields where they can grow things. The whole community was just swept by this one man alone. Until mothers were scared of, her, of him. You know why they were scared of him? Because their sons want to follow him. That is the beauty of a life of a person who truly is a soul winner, a feature of man. Not by what he says alone. He was a person devoted. It is thought, Jesus, the very thought of thee. With sweetness fills my breast. And he was focused on just having a life, a devotional life, absolutely devoted to Christ. And that's how he won people to Christ. And that's what we really ought to be challenged to do as well. It is not just saying, quoting Bible verses. Have you heard of John 3.16? It is this is my life. People look at your life and they say, I admire your life. There is such a sense of purpose. There is such a sense of power. There is such a presence of God in your life. How can I have the same type of life? And they turn to Christ. This is what it's all about. Being a fisher of men. And I can tell you, a lot of people have lived out this way. It is not evangelism only from the pulpit. It is not the preacher preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the average Christian living out his life as a member of the church and then building the church community and the church begins to grow. And then people who come are people who say, well, we like the way you are. We like your spirit. We like a sense of purpose. We like the sense of power from God. We like the presence of God. And what we hear, they are great truths. And that's what it is. That's what we want to be. And it's something that we need to look at very, very carefully. Can we do this? That's our individual and corporate challenge. And if we can think about this personally, individually, and we can think about this as well corporately, then Bethel is set to grow further. Otherwise, we'll just be where we are every Sunday, same old, same old, and that's it. The church needs to be growing. The church needs to be thriving. The church needs to be alive. The church needs to be really on fire for the Lord. Otherwise, the church will soon die. We are 42 years old this year at Bethany and we are still committed to growing. We're going to devote $9 million to growing further. That's our way of saying this is what we are committed to doing. Do we believe in growth? Yes. Why? Because we believe in souls, big one. How? By our lives, individually, corporately. That's how we live out our faith in the Lord. That's our challenge. This is what we mean by becoming fishes of men, individually. Not only by what we say we believe in, by who we are and what we are. And we've got nothing to show for it. Then we've got nothing to show for it. The challenge is to have something to show for our expression, our confession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is our challenge. Think about this. Well, let's pray together.
Once again, we pray together. Once again, we look into our hearts. And this morning, we want to focus on Bethel and the future of the church. My word to all who are young people today, I'm going to challenge you to grow and train yourself to serve the Lord. We need people who are deeply, deeply committed. And they will grow and they will groom and train themselves morning by morning, opening their hearts, their ears, their eyes to the Lord. That's the first part. And then to be that salt and to be that light, to be that city, to be that pillar, to be that living, vibrant church. That's how the church will grow. Then the future of the church will be very strong and very bright. This is what we need to think about. This is what we need to pray about very much. Our Father, we pray for your grace and for your mercy. We recognize our weaknesses individually and corporately as a church. And we bring before you all these weaknesses, all these problems, all these difficulties which are right in front of us. Father, we pray that you will help us to come alive, to be that church that we were meant to be. We pray that you will teach us how we can really reach out corporately as a witness to people all around. That's what we were meant to be. We pray that you will help us to be deeply challenged, to do our part, to make Bethel strong, to become a bulwark of the church, to be pillars. We pray that you would help us to deal with the personal difficulties and problems in our life. Wash and cleanse us from the things that so easily beset us. Help us to run this race with great diligence, with great perseverance and stamina. We pray for your grace, your mercy. In Jesus' name, Amen.